You and I with Rashmi Shetty is a human library audio podcast bringing in stories of people you and I can draw inspiration from. Welcome to the third season of this amazing story listening journey. Ordinary folks, extraordinary lives, their uniqueness and individuality making them interesting to talk to and to listen to. Each one of them completely connected to the voice in me and with motivational stories of moving beyond themselves to make a difference in the world. A reaffirmation of the fact, open your eyes wider. The world is far more beautiful when we acknowledge the presence of both you and I. Our guest today is Jagdish Kinney. Jagdish is a strategic thinker, master at building high-performance leadership teams, passionate executive coach and mentor, educationist and social philanthropist. He is a hands-on specialist, consultant and advisor in the FMCG and telecom sectors. He is a strategy planner, executioner and organization development consultant. Jagdish was formerly the executive director and CEO of Airtel and MD and CEO of Gillette India. He brings a huge understanding of the Indian and international business environments, especially in the telecom, FMCG and retail segments, combined with a vast leadership experience in managing and motivating large teams. People management, sales processes and decision making are the other areas close to his heart. At Procter & Gamble, Jagdish learned to manage and build brands. At L'Oreal and at Gillette, he learned to manage and build companies. At Airtel, he learned to build an industry. He considers himself to be blessed to be in the right place, the right company and at the right time. Listen in as Jagdish shares his amazing journey, leadership lessons, handling oneself during layoffs and how to build a positive outlook in life. Hi Jagdish. Such a pleasure having you on You and I with Rashmi Shetty. Hey, Rashmi, long time. <laughs> <laughs> really long. And you know, You and I is all about exploring the uniqueness and individuality that each of us carry. I have known you as somebody who's always the life in a place. You have some amazing inputs in a conversation. And then you're a very patient listener to see what the others have to contribute. I am very curious to know, was little Jagdish also somebody who was a very patient listener, observant of the world around him and uh, good at studies, nerdy in school, teacher's pet? Your childhood is something that I'd really love to explore. And the journey from little Jagdish to the Jagdish Kini that the world knows you today as is one journey, I'm sure, which is fascinating. Where were you born and how did the journey begin? Well, how much time do we have? Because this journey you're asking for is can go on for days. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let me try and uh, sort of uh, keep it as short as possible. Yeah, born in Bombay uh, in the year 1955, a scorpion. So, you know, some people are scared of scorpions. Some people love scorpions. Uh, I think my wife loves a scorpion. So it's, it's, it's great. <laughs> born in a, a middle class family which struggled. Mm -hmm. uh, so we struggled for almost everything. But in all that struggle, my parents uh, had only one priority for all the four children. We have four children, two boys and two girls. The two girls are older to me and uh, my brother is younger to me. My second sister, uh, we lost her two years ago to cancer. Other than that, my older sister is in US. My younger brother is in US. I'm here in India. Uh, I never was fascinated by the US. I don't know why. But my mother, she was amazing. She, she made ends meet every time. No matter what uh, we asked for, uh, she would actually, without giving it to us, uh, would make us feel okay about it. So it was, it was an amazing sort of a attitude she had. Because for her and for my dad, uh, education was the one place that they would invest, no matter how much it costs. So education, they, be uh, they believed, which again is something that is passed on to me. Uh, even I believe in and that that if if one is educated, uh, he can actually or she can actually make a life of it. You know, so education is something that I talk a lot about. I 
I, I try and promote also for, for, for the female education candidates. So. But other than that, I, I think I've had a very normal upbringing in the sense of a whole lot of fears. But along with a whole lot of fears, uh, I had a whole lot of dreams. Uh, if I have to look at my childhood, it was full of dreams. I dreamt about almost everything. But the one thing I didn't know, which I knew much later in life, uh, probably, probably that's the turning point in my life. Uh, till 24, till the age of 24, none of my goals were met. None. From 25 onwards, every goal of mine has been met. And if I have to, I mean, okay, uh, at the age of 24, my wife came into my life as my girlfriend. And uh, so therefore, maybe she brought in the change. But uh, honestly, if I have to really look for a reason why I, this change happened, I think I realized that opportunities come in overalls, which means a whole lot of hard work, a whole lot of focus, and a whole lot of energy to, to be put behind that opportunity. So dreams are all about opportunities, and opportunities come in overall. So therefore, calls for a whole lot of hard work, which as a child, till I was 24, probably I, I expected the dreams to happen. I mean, mm. you, you heard about everybody talking about dream, 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 and it'll happen. And it never happened. I think that's one of the big transformations that I went through from a child to my current being. Another thing I would say is I've been lucky as a child to experience. We didn't have the resources for many things, but uh, I think the opportunity to experience life was humongous. Where we stayed in Bombay, I think there was a gang of about 30, 35 children, all age groups, uh, you know, maybe four or five years older than me and two, three years younger than me. So about 40, 30, 40 people of us. So playing games, learning how to manage friends, learning about relationships, uh, the fights that we had, uh, the games that we played, the competition, how to compete and how not to compete. Everything was through an experience. I must be one of those few Bombay-born, brought up kids who experienced the village life uh, completely. Every year we would go to Mangalore, to our hometown. Climbing a coconut tree and trying to conquer that coconut tree was very normal. And slipping and falling and burning your inner thighs was very, very normal. Sitting on a gawa tree or a mango tree reading a book was again very normal. Riding a bullet cart. And I've done that. In all these experiences, there were some major learnings. And one learning was, uh, I was about 14 years old, I think. And we were in Mangalore uh, in this place called Murbidri, my, my paternal uh, grandparents' home. My paternal grandfather had expired when my mother was five. So it was all his brothers who brought them up. And that eldest, the living gentleman there, the, high, the head of the family, I mean, he was a businessman with a difference. He, he, did, he did business to look after the village. So he, he sold uh, roti, roti and makan. So anything that was going into staple food, he was, he was selling. And he was selling stuff which was to repair houses. And then he realized that in his uh, village, uh, people could not get trucks to get stuff, you know, though they wanted to build or repair the house. If they have to get stuff, like cement, for example, they didn't have transport. So he actually invested in a, in a, in a truck, which was used mainly for the village requirements. And we at 14, me and a cousin of mine actually saw the truck driver sleeping, took the keys out of from below his pillow. And took it out for a ride. My bad luck, when I was at the wheel, my grandfather was on his evening walk. And he saw the truck. He didn't say anything. We realized that he had seen it. And I was petrified. I was scared. When I went home in the evening after all this musty of us, he called me to his room and he said, you know, I thought he was going to fire me. But he always spoke in a very low decibel voice. And he said, uh, Jagdish, uh, to me, you are an intelligent boy. How could you put somebody else's life at risk? Such a big learning at a decibel level, which was so soft, so soft. And I believe that was a very, very big learning for me. Since that day, I've learned to take accountability and responsibility for my actions. Thank you, Grandpa. That was amazing. These are things which has helped me become the person that I am. I feel blessed. I mean, absolutely blessed that I was born in that family. 
what we went through, the experiences we had, everything. It was amazing. Uh, if you have to look back, uh, I don't think there's any regret at all. I have lived life the way I wanted to live. Yes, there are times when I say I didn't get this and I didn't get that. Those wants were there, those needs were there. But I mean, everybody has something which is not fulfilled. But I think most of what I wanted were fulfilled in different ways, in very, very different ways. And I, I mean, I think uh, I feel I feel very fulfilled, you know, because the opportunities I got to learn and grow. Even when I finished my graduation and I said I was going to look for a job, my father said, do you want to do an MSc? I said, no. I said, why? I said, I don't want to be a lab assistant. So he said, then what is it you want to do? So I said, uh, I'll look for a job. And he said, would you like to join a bank? I said, no, I don't want to join a bank. As you know, our community, everybody goes into the bank, Syndicate Bank, Canada Bank, uh, and, and many other banks that our community people have built. I said no to the bank. And then he said, okay, then go search a job and get yourself a job. And he used to give me 10 rupees in the morning and say, okay, see you in the evening. All the best. Five rupees in that fire, 10 rupees he used to go to the bus fair. Five rupees or four rupees, 50 paise was a Udupi Thali. And I would go every day, 83 Limited or 84 Limited, take a bus, go to Nariman Point, visit office by office, uh, write down your CV in the evening make copies. And those days, copies were handwritten, you know, and there were no photocopying yeah. and everything. So life was great here. I mean, uh, and I, I, I remember I got a job with, uh, I think it was Glaxo. And uh, the job was a sales guy. And I thought it would be a good job. And I came back home and I told my parents and my sister was sitting there, older sister. And she was that time studying MBBS. And she was in a final year MBBS. And she said, oh, so you're going to be a medical rep and you'll come and sit and wait for a doctor for three hours. Huh? And I, I didn't know, I, I mean, whether that was saying don't take the job or what, what, you know. So I went and I said, uh, I can't take the job because I don't want it. So those guys got very upset on me. Why, why don't you want it? And I couldn't explain. But anyway, then I got my job with Siemens and then life began and uh, career began. And here we are, uh, 45 years later, talking to each other and feeling happy about it. Wow. So there are nuggets that you got at the right time, appropriate time, but stayed with the life lessons that those came along and yeah. definitely shaped you to who you are. I love that statement, Jagdish, that you said that opportunities come in overalls. When you look back, and in the journey that started from Siemens or the rejection that you did of Glaxo, what is it that you learned about the essence of choice and leadership there? Today, much later in life, uh, I have some of my one-liners and one of my one-liners about choice is that, you know, you are what you are because of the choices you've made in the past. If that be true, then you have the power to create the future. I didn't know about choices as a, as a child, but my parents, my grandparents, they offered these choices through their communication, through options that they gave it to us. My mother didn't give options. She only told us to lay the table or to clean the table. You know, so there was no options. If there was an option, I would say, no, I'm studying. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my dad and my, my grandfather, they definitely gave us options. I learned about the value of options and value of choosing right. When I actually spent that one month looking for a job, every time I, I would enter an office and, you know, meet the receptionist and say, you know, hi, I'm looking for a job. And most of the time they were there, we have no vacancies, you know. It's like a salesman coming now to your doorstep and you say, no, no, kuch ne chahiye or how people intrude on your phone. And, and, you know, moment you see the number, which is not familiar to you, you know, it's a sales call and then you snub it and you put it off. So there I realized some of them were uh, helpful and were willing to entertain me. Then came the question in my mind is, you know, you, you begin to doubt when, when things are a little easy. So then I said, Are, should I join this company or not? To understand the culture of the organization, I would visit the toilet of that organization. And if the toilet was clean and well maintained, then I would say, oh, maybe this, this is a good organization to join. Now, don't ask me how that connects. But somewhere there was a deep connection to say that if the culture is good, it, it will be seen in clean toilets. I don't know why, but even today, I remember in all the companies that I worked in or I managed, I would inspect the toilets to, to make sure that the, the toilets were clean and, 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 and hygienic. You know, that's one place I feel that we don't give enough credence to or enough importance to. And I think uh, I had this thing about 
making sure that this is, is, is good. Coming back to choices, I think uh, the choice of joining Siemens and meeting friends there. I made quite a few friends there. I'm still in touch with them. We have a WhatsApp group of those and we call it old timers. Recently, two months ago, I went all the way to Chandigarh to meet my first boss and my wife came along with me. She had never met Mickey when I was in Siemens because she she didn't know me at that time. So she said, no, no, even I want to come and meet Mickey because Mickey, Mickey actually gave me the first uh, leadership lesson. You know, I, I was handling some part of uh, on the accounting side uh, for switchboard factory and uh, I was finding a lot of issues there the way it was being managed. So I tried to make a suggestion and maybe my suggestion, my communication must have been irritating. I don't know. You know, these young guys come and they, they think they can change the world. So I must have come across as that to that manager. So he called up Mickey and he said, get this guy out of my department right now. So Mickey called me up and I said, okay. And I came back. So Mickey asked me what happened. So I, I tried to tell Mickey what happened. And then Mickey said, uh, I want you to think about one thing, Jagdish. Tomorrow morning when you come to work, uh, let's chat at nine o'clock. And if you and me can change Siemens in a day, we start tomorrow morning. I couldn't sleep that night. Next morning, I went to him and I said, Mickey, you're right. Uh, takes time. He says, bloody well, it takes awful time. It takes a hell of a lot of time. Don't try to change things immediately. It takes time for people to ap appreciate and acknowledge that this can be changed and there's a better way of looking at it. And I think that was where my journey as a leader started. And then life went on. And then some of my friends said, uh, and study with us. They were doing cost accountancy. So I, I had never done accounting before. So I said, let me start learning. Uh, because learning is something that was instilled in me as, as important. So I tried it and I realized it's not possible to learn now. Uh, while still working. And I couldn't give up my job to do a cost accountancy course because it takes a long time. And that's when I met uh, another friend of mine from Siemens and he talked to me about IIMs. So I tried getting into IIMs. Uh, I would get through the return, but uh, get blasted in the, in the group discussion because Stephens versus IIT. And two, three of us, non-IIT, non-Stephens would sit and watch. And we came out of the room plastered with bandages and we never made it. So finally, I made it to SIBM and uh, I think uh, I got it to, I got into SIBM because I had to meet Anjali there. So that's, that's really the, they say, no, 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 marriages are made in heaven. God made sure I didn't get into IIM. <laughs> I got into SIBM and that's where I met Anjali. But about choices, I think there are, life is all about choices. And I, I've made a lot of wrong choices. I've made a lot of good choices. And I remember the good choices, not the bad choices. Very true. And then going on your journey further from these choices that you made, then SIBM's journey where you met Anjali and right at the beginning, you said things shifted the moment you met Anjali. Maybe she brought it along with her, but uh, life started looking very different, being very different. And you got every goal that you set. So was it your time at SIBM that gave you clarity on what to expect of life, what to have as your goals and where you more focused. Uh, because like you said, opportunity comes in overalls. Were you able to remove that overall to see what it is that uh, in the opportunity before you that you needed to focus on? Uh, how and what changed? I think, I think uh, SIBM offered experiences and interaction with professors and faculty and external people who were authentic people, who were vulnerable, who were beautiful. You know, I still remember, if you see my book, I started my book with a chapter talking about P.C. Narayan, an amazing guy, simply amazing. And he was a few years older than us. He was an engineer working in Telco, and he was a visiting faculty for us. Some of the things he talked to us were very insightful, very, very insightful. And when you start reading my book, you'll, you'll remember that, that P.C. Narayan's model, which he gave us, it's such a simple, simple model, but it's so impactful. When I talk about it in my book, my wife read it and says, when did PC say this? I said, that means you people don't pay attention to when PC was talking. He would talk like it's a matter of fact. Yeah, he didn't say that I'm going to give you some golden nuggets. He would just say it because he had to say it. He was sharing. His, his lectures were all sharing. It wasn't a lecture. And whoever could pick up what you want got so much of benefit from these guys. You know, I still remember uh, the dean of the institute, uh, Colonel B.S.K. Chopra. And in his very first lecture, he asked us, you know, now that you are doing a professional course, uh, you know, some of you might want to smoke in the class, some of you don't want to smoke in the class. But 
if you people want to smoke in the class, you must find out whether others object to it. So we can have a poll right now and then you can find out, you know, if the majority is. And he actually allowed us to smoke in class. And I was surprised that, you know, it, it was, you know, management at its core was so liberal. And, and it was about how you, how you look at stuff. Uh, what is your focus on? What is your attention on? And, you know, Colonel, Colonel Chopra really taught us these nuances of life uh, rather than management. You know, I still remember the way he used to write his diary. Such a neat diary and such a beautiful way of writing his diary. He never missed a single appointment. He was always on time. And I asked him, sir, how do you manage? And he said, oh, sit down. I'll let you, I'll tell you how I do my diary. And he actually shared how he writes his diary. Now, you know, when that opportunity comes, you can also say that I'm, I'm busy. I'll talk to you tomorrow and forget about it. But he never did that. He always shared, always shared, and shared immediately. And I remember one more thing he had told us, which I took very seriously. And he said, you know, uh, boys and girls, remember, your salary is not enough. Salary is required to live. But if you want to create wealth, appreciate, acknowledge, appreciate, and buy shares and invest in shares. And he said, you must study about companies. And you will learn in the next two years about companies and how to study balance sheets and stuff like that. But if you don't do that, wealth will be difficult to come along. You know, it's almost 20 years since I gave up uh, industry. And I can tell you that uh, his, his insight was so meaningful. When I was quitting industry, I had a pretty good uh, salary, but uh, I didn't have too much of wealth. And whatever has happened after that is through investments. So if you can really invest well, your money will earn money for you. And I think that's it's a major learning that he gave in the very first lecture of, of uh, our MBA class and uh, amazing, you know, and I think things change there. I mean, it's, I don't think Anjali played such a big role in changing me, but certainly opportunities that we had in the Institute, you know, I was the president of the, of the students council in the second year. There was a time when uh, he would call me for every decision that he would impact uh, the students. And I would say, but sir, you can take the decision. Why don't you just, he said, no, no, this is a student run institute. So I need your okay before I announce the decision. So what do you think about it? And it was a joint decision. Every decision was a joint decision. These were things which were not taught as management uh, lessons, but we got the experience. And then after you get the experience, if you're, if you're smart enough, you'll pick it up. And if you think it's good enough, you'll implement it and inculcate it in your style. In your style. SIBM gave me that opportunity to experience and to decide for myself as to what kind of leadership style I want to adopt. And where did life take you after SIBM to implement these leadership lessons and choices? Oh, well, I started with Procter & Gamble. I was with Procter & Gamble for uh, close to nine odd years. Uh, I left them to start uh, L'Oreal in India. That came as an opportunity again. And uh, I left L'Oreal after about seven years or eight years with them. I became the, the managing director for uh, Gillette India. I was, in, I was in Dubai with my boss at that time when, as, the, as the regional director. And then I came to India as the managing director for Gillette India. I, I, I spent about what close to about four and a half years with them. And that's the time when uh, the mid-40 blues hit me. And uh, I started asking myself as to what am I doing in life? Uh, what is important? What is not important? I, I think uh, I repeated uh, visits to Calcutta on many or different occasions, uh, uh, even during L'Oreal and during Gillette, were very disturbing at times. The poverty that one could see on the streets at the, in those years, I'm talking of the 90s, was very disturbing. And you know, and here was Jagdish, uh, managing director, posh car, posh office, you know, a good salary, stakeholders all happy, good bonuses and stuff like that. And it was disturbing as to what, what am I doing? When I look back and I was asking myself those questions, I would always tend to compare myself with my past and, and from a background of not enough resources to a situation where resources are enough and plenty. You know, we could afford uh, international holidays and stuff like that. The answers always came that, you know, everybody's happy. So why, why, are you, why are you asking these questions? And I wanted to ask myself the question as to what's the kind of impact that I want to have, which led me to asking impact where, how, what. And I said, 
the impact i'm having on my family my stakeholders my company my team my management everybody is happy but the the man on the street i don't know whether he's happy with what i am doing and that was somewhere it was disturbing in many different ways and i think you know as a coach you know uh, in the in our in our brain we have the reticular activation system where ras where if you if you activate it very often you find the opportunities which come to you it's not that these opportunities were not there earlier it was always there but uh, you begin to see it because you're now energizing it and when i was doing this uh, there came an opportunity to meet sunil mittal and uh, somebody asked me to meet him and have a cup of tea and i was wondering why cup of tea with him you know and but i said okay i mean since you have told him that i'll come it's worth meeting somebody new and and finding out how an entrepreneur thinks till then my my interaction with entrepreneurs was not too high it was all multinational companies uh, set rules set sops everything was there you know so i met sunil and uh, in that one hour he was talking he was talking about his aspiration his ambition as an entrepreneur atel was at that stage only in delhi and in uh, i think it was himachal pradesh two small circles uh, delhi i mean as a city is large but as a circle it's not large enough uh, when compared to other circles and himachal was a very small circle i think they were we were only in those two and uh, they had started talking to jtm about the acquisition of jtm so they were looking for somebody to join and and take over that uh, organization jtm was uh, uh, that time having uh, licenses for karnataka andhra and punjab when we were talking to sunil i saw on the other side of the coin on the other side his coin on his side of the coin he was talking of his aspirations as a as a entrepreneur and for atel he wanted to see a huge organization but on the other side of the coin i saw my opportunity or my purpose of making a difference to the average indian on the road immediately what flashed in my mind was i remember uh, my father applied for a telephone in bombay it took us 14 years to get a telephone and in the 14th year we got the telephone because my sister graduated as a doctor so there was a doctors quota so our phone which was in the wait list became got transferred to doctors quota and we got a phone at home i said if it's taken us 14 years and communication talking to each other is so important the economy had started opening up uh, 92 was when manmohan singh had actually started it and we were now talking about 99 2000 to hasten this opening of the economy we need to communicate and i remember i think uh, sunil had actually said you know this is like building a highway but a communication highway and i said it's so important if somebody can have a phone in his hand immediately and start talking immediately it will make a big difference to anybody and everybody in their lives and i said yes i'll join now i was leaving C- gillette to join us a very small organization all those fears were still there but that belief in myself belief in my ability and my capabilities was that if it didn't work out i could always get another job but i had this opportunity and if i don't take this opportunity i will be losing out not some not somebody else i will be losing out because i got this opportunity to to do it and i said it comes in overalls is what i said which meant i have there's a whole lot of work to be done there's a whole lot of effort to be put in you know it's not easy to build an organization i had done it with loreal and i knew how much effort we put in those 7 8 years and i said okay let me do it again but this time in technology and let's try what we can see and what we can do and that purpose of mine i had also learned you know through my sport about visioning in cricket and uh, everything even in athletics we were taught we need to vision what we want to do so i did my visioning exercise with myself uh, when i joined atel and i said uh, the picture in my mind was uh, when the maid at home the lady who was helping us at home if she gets a mobile phone in her hand and i see an auto driver with a mobile phone in his hand i think my job is done that's when i joined them in 2000 this was the picture i had in mind 2005 my maid had a phone every auto driver had a phone and many more people had a phone and i had enough uh, stories i've heard from fishermen in gujarat and other places of how their life had changed and that's when i decided that i need to hang my boots and i quit industry 45 days before i turned 50 Oh wow your vision was very large though it may seem very simple that my maid and the auto driver should have a mobile in hand the fact that they should get it means 
there are many other layers that need to be conquered. So how did this overall picture pan out for the next few years that you were there? But more than anything else, how did you start with culture first? The opportunity that Airtel offered was very unique in the sense that our dreams were big, our aspirations were big. We knew that we could make it big and JTM was small. They had a license for a huge place and they had not done much about it. So they had a few towers only in Bangalore and a few towers only in Hyderabad. Punjab, they had not even started work for which we had to pay penalties. The opportunity was like almost like a clean slate. I could write on that slate what I believed in. And, and, you know, and I still remember it was, I think it was in November of 2000, uh, where we had our first uh, employee forums meet. And by that time, uh, we had grown from about, I think when we bought uh, JTM, we must have been about 200 people or 250 people of strength. And then the first uh, employee forum that I was addressing was about 800 or 900 people. And I remember I stood there and I said, you know, our vision is to build an organization which is perpetual and is going to build global benchmarks for the telecom industry. I don't know how many of those 800 or 1000 people who were there in that room believed this old man and said, yes, yes, we can do it or must have laughed. I, at that stage, I firmly believe we could do it. And every other employee forum, I would repeat our vision simply because I knew that if I didn't believe in it, I could not communicate it. So for me to tell my people that we will build this, you know, global benchmarks for telecom. I had to first believe in it. And therefore, I, I started repeating it, not for them, but for myself. You know, I had to ask myself, do I still believe in it? And if I do still believe in it, then I can talk about it, you know. So, I, I mean, it continued. And as a result, everybody started believing in it. I think it was Simon Sinek in one of his talks had said, I think he was talking about uh, Martin Luther King, I think he was talking about. When he said that, you know, the people who came there to listen to Martin Luther King did not come there because it was Martin Luther's dream that he had, but it was my dream is the same as Martin Luther King's dream. And I think I had another opportunity was to get people to join us since we were so small and we wanted to grow fast. Getting people was my choice. I mean, I, I could choose people. So therefore, if I can choose people, I decided one was I'm going to choose people who are better than me, people who are younger than me, people who are better than me and people who are more energetic and more intelligent than me. So I went looking for such people and my job became easy. You know, when you have such a, a great team with you, you don't have to work. My work was basically on one day of the or two days of a year, whereas when, when we actually made the, the budgets for the following year. And of course, when I had to interact with the board and you know, present to the board. So my job was very easy, actually. I, I saw myself as motivating people, meeting people, transforming people and I just enjoyed that job. I, I mean, I, love, I loved what I was doing. Yes, there was a lot of strategy, trying to stay online, on strategy and everything. But all that was not, was not coming across as a job. It was coming across as fun. And it was marvelous time, those five and a half years, where, where we built Airtel from almost... Uh, I think when I took, took it up, it was about 250 crores or 275 crores. When I left, we were two and a half billion dollars. And uh, we were about uh, 35,000 customers. And when I left, uh, we were about 3 million or 4 million customers. It was, it was amazing. And we had our ups and downs. We had our tough days. We had all those. But I think customer centricity, people believing that only people can make the difference. For me, I believe only people make the difference. For me, that was the culture which I implemented, which we ran in in in, in Airtel. So for me, that was so easy. If people have to make the difference and you think people can make the difference, you will give the respect to the person. And if you do that, uh, that person will do what she has to do. You know, nobody will shirk their job. Everybody is keen to have a great career. Believe in those people, believe in yourself. It'll happen. And it happened. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's very true. But to get that culture into a place that you're trying to grow, what is important is humility and simplicity, two traits and qualities that extremely successful people, it is said, definitely display. So in your journey as the top leader, wherever you've been, how important do you think these two traits are? Simplicity and humility, are they attitudes? Are they character traits? What are they? I, I think they're very, very, very important. Breaking down something complex is an art. And I also believe that if I can communicate in a very simple way, whatever the issue is or whatever the strategy is, if I can communicate in a very simple way, my understanding of that is very deep. This was demonstrated by my staff, my, my teammates. In Airtel, the language we used was very simple. We did not mince words. 
but kept it so simple and so respectful. I mean, we were working 13 hours a day, 13 to 14 hours a day. And end of the day, we were all energetic enough to continue. But we had to go home and have dinner and rest because bodies need the rest. But otherwise, I think simplicity is something we, I mean, let me let me give a small example what it just came to my mind. You know, this is taking simplicity to the other end. I had a CTO, forget his name, the first CTO in Karnataka he was, the Bengali gentleman. You know, we used to, for every tower that we need, we needed to put up, uh, every additional tower that we had to put up, towers were those days very costly. Uh, it was an investment of crores of rupees for a single tower. And, and uh, there was a huge amount of ROI calculation, finance getting involved and, you know, and then sales being told, can you do research and tell us whether we can get so many postpaid, so many prepaid, you know, X, falana, falana, falana. So it was complicated stuff to put up one tower. And I remember this, not CTO, huh, the CTO. CTO said, you know, Jagdish, life is simple. So I said, yeah, tell me. He says, you know, Jagdish, you decide and we decide where to put up a tower. Now, we also know that to get an ROI of the tower, we need 500 postpaid and we need some 250 prepaid. That becomes the target for the sales guy there. So I said, wow, it's really simple, isn't it? <laughs> and how do we get that sales? <laughs> so he said, no, no, that sales guys will know how to get sales. So they'll get the sales. But he, he, he just said, in a matter of two minutes, he said, we don't have to do ROI. We don't have to do all this, you know, ROAC and AEC and all that. You know, just, just forget all this. Just decide where to put the tower and give that location sales guy the target. I said, yes, uh, not everything is as simple as you put it. But, and broke down complex situations and strategies and plans into simple, actionable actions and, and strategies. So people actually could relate to their responsibilities. Now, I always believe that if you're talking about a huge vision, every person that in the company needs to know how that person is contributing to that vision. Unless I don't know my role, my responsibility, and how I'm contributing, my contribution is never committed fully. So I need to understand my role. Where do I fit in? And simplifying stuff helps that person to understand exactly her role in what she's doing to contribute to that big picture of us. And every person in the organization must understand this for her role and for her responsibility. And I think simplifying language, simplifying complex situations, simplifying strategies is very important. Humility, without humility, I mean, I don't even know how to answer this question because uh, it's, it's so difficult to run an organization if you're not humble. Because you have to connect to people. If you want to build a, a fighting team, if you want to build a great team, you want to build a winning team, you need to connect to people. You cannot connect without humility. It's as simple as that. If humility is a part of your being, you will connect with people. You will connect from your heart with the other people. And if you can connect with your heart, I don't think you need words to even tell, talk about it. You know? and, and people will, will enjoy what they're doing. And once they enjoy what they're doing and they understand their roles and responsibility, you have to be a successful organization. And that's what I used to keep telling Airtel, my people in Airtel. We have to be because we are born to win. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah. So, any uh, moments, Jagdish, any stories that you have that reiterate for you your journey and how it has been satisfying, full of simplicity, humility, meeting those visions, learning from people, all that you spoke about. Any stories, any milestones, any moments that you reflect and you smile about even today? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Etel, there's so many people who who have told me that I was easier to connect to and they found it easier to talk to me than they would talk, they could find it easier to talk to their own circle CEO, for example. I, I think the only reason was, uh, again, I, I did various things which others don't do. Like, for example, in Etel, Whichever office I was in, whichever state or circle I was in, for that day, I would say I would go to the office at 8.15. Uh, 8.15 to 9.15, I used to be with my own work, with my own laptop and for the day, anything that I'm missing out, anything that I need to be you know, important that I need to take care of, 
All that I would do in that 8.15 to 9.15 or 9.30. 9.30 in the morning, the office would start. And I would go to the topmost floor of our office building, whether it was Hyderabad or Bangalore or Pune or Chennai or Kerala or wherever I was. We had about four or five floors office. So I'd go to the topmost floor and walk around that floor, say hi to people. I try to remember on people's names. If somebody's spouse or somebody's family member is not well, uh, and I would ask the HR if there was any cases like this, then I would walk up to that person and inquire about the family member's health and stuff like that. You know, So I asked my people to keep me, my leadership team, to keep me informed about anything that is there. But the connect that I made with people was direct. Uh, I always went and met people in, where they sat. I never used my phone to talk to people within Airtel. And okay, the reason for that, uh, I'll tell you later. Just remind me, I'll tell you the reason why I, I, I stopped using my phone in, in, in uh, Airtel. Uh, so I would really connect with people. And then I would come to the next floor, next floor, next floor, next floor. And I would really, for me, that was very important half an hour to 40 minutes. Uh, meeting people and just just saying hi to them. Of course, uh, a lot of people uh, thought that that was my round to see who's on time, who's not on time, which I didn't bother. But, well, it's their way of looking at it. I also know that, I came to know this after I left Ayrton, that the uh, moment I would start my walk to the topmost floor, messages would go T.O.P., T.O.P., T.O.P. So I used to wonder, you know, then, then I asked some guys, you know, I know some, the sales guys are very mischievous guys. So it all started in sales only, TOP. So I asked one guy, what does TOP stand for? He said, nothing, sir. TOP is top. So I said, no, no, I know. Tell me what does TOP stand for? Then he said, now that you've left, we can tell you. So I said, yeah, yeah, tell me. So he said, tiger on the prowl. <laughs> so TOP would go around and then, uh, you know, but they enjoyed it. Uh, tiger rose on the prowl, but uh, everyone enjoyed it and they looked forward to me coming there. If I didn't come one day there, they would say, hey, easy traveling or easy somewhere else, you know. So they knew that. So that was actually, I think, really connecting with people, staying connected to people. We still meet. We have these get togethers in Hyderabad and Bangalore and Pune and other places as well. Uh, we get together and we spend hours together. In Hyderabad, they said, uh, we don't want a get together, which is for two, three hours. So they say we start in the afternoon and you leave the next morning. So you stay in the same hotel. So Hyderabad has taken it to another level. That's the Andhra team. We all meet regularly. Every time we meet, it's 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 amazing. You know, and today I when I see them, so many of them doing different things and doing very successful stuff, it gives a sense of satisfaction, you know, that uh, we work together and we share this special bond. They know that I am there if they need any help. And I know that they are there if I need any help. So that bond which is there, which has created for those five years, is still very, very strong. And I believe uh, that was because we all connected with each other. Ah, that story, why, why I didn't... Once, uh, you know, my phone number is ending with 80,000. Uh, and and uh, once I was talking to somebody on the phone, and my phone had a problem or something went wrong. So I used the landline, which I had in the office, and I used the landline to call somebody internally again. And I realized... Uh, and he picked up the phone and said, hello. So I said, hello. This catch I And I realized, you know, I said, so that means this, this etiquette of phone, is it only for 80,000? And I said, no, this is, I need to change this. And I said, I must walk around and I, 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 I need to connect and I need to talk to people, you know, and, and understand. And uh, I really, every opportunity I got of talking of customer centricity, I did that. I know, you know, in, in, when you're building something or you're changing something, Communication is very, very, very critical. And I paid a lot of attention to that. And I kept that simple and it worked. You are, you are a wise coach. So this is a great uh, proof that communication is very, very critical in life and in business. Yeah, that's so true. And I remember at your book launch, the feedback that people gave and the experiences they shared for me was proof how human you made the role that you had uh, played in their lives and in the company to help them wherever they are. It was very evident for me, Jagdish, that the human being in you was working more than making sure everyone is a human doing around there. And it was very clear with all the feedback that people gave so personal and how you had touched each of them at a very personal level. 
And talking about communication and connect, the pandemic was one time when we physically could not meet and you just shared why it was so important for you to go there and talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, yes, yes. All of us took back our lessons. But what have your reflections from the pandemic been? When the pandemic made me think a lot, made me reflect a lot, made me ask a lot of questions to myself. My mother-in-law saw the pandemic very differently. Once she had said, uh, oh, it's a great opportunity for all us to be together all the time. And I was thinking about that as well. And I said, yes, you know. And, and she was really talking about the relationships, you know. And uh, are, we, are we investing enough? Perhaps was the question that she didn't ask. You know, so that made me reflect. Uh, we moved coaching from a face-to-face -to, -face to a phone or, a, or a, on the net. And that became a new way of learning, a new way of uh, doing work, a new way of uh, managing something which we believed was not effective enough when we started. But then we had to make it effective and we found pleasure in it. And, we, you know, so it's all about experiencing. If I have to reflect upon what stops us from experiencing is wanting to be in the comfort zone. So once you step out of the comfort zone, it's amazing how you are in the flow and you don't even know when you enter the learning and the growth zones. And today, you know, coaching on the net has become so impactful and widely accepted. During those times when I was coaching, on the, on the net, I realized my own introspection told me that I'm not effective enough as I was in the face-to-face. -face. What is so different? Am I, am I not putting enough effort? Am I not doing enough uh, preparation before the coaching, post-coaching? All those questions, I kept saying, no, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. But yet, you know, that energy was a bit low. And somewhere I realized that because of the pandemic, I could not play golf. Now, not playing golf impacted my coaching. And I said, I can't let this to happen to my clients. Pandemic is pandemic, but I can't use that as an excuse to be ineffective. I have to do something about the golf part. And I realized that the visioning exercises and all that I used to do earlier in my uh, workshops and stuff like that. And I said, I can do a visioning exercise here also on golf. So I actually put a mat on my terrace, small carpet mat, took my golf clubs up, took one ball, kept it there. And started imagining my course. And I would play my full 18 holes. Of course, it, I mean, when you play the 18 holes, it takes about four or five hours. But I could finish 18 holes in about half an hour to 45 minutes. Because when you're imagining, you think you are the best, world's best golfer. And every shot of yours is straight. And every hole is a par or a, or a birdie. You know? But it gave me back my mojo. It gave me back my energy to coach. And I realized that you can always find ways to bring back your energy. You can always find ways to do what you want to do. You can always find ways, provided you keep an open mind and ask yourself searching questions. The other thing I did was, uh, you know, I still had a lot of time, which I couldn't go out. So I was in the house. How much can you talk to your wife and, you know, in a day, you know, so I started writing my book and that's the book which got released two years later. And I found that again, very, very uh, satisfying, fulfilling because I didn't know how many people would read my book. I wrote the book for, because I wanted to write. I wrote the book because I wanted to share. People buy it or don't buy it was not, not the focus at all. And that gave me the satisfaction of writing that book. You know? And I thought uh, when it became a bestseller on Amazon, I thought uh, release the hostage gave me great satisfaction. And it was very fulfilling. Yeah. Uh, and, I, I, and a lot of people came back and uh, told me that, you know, very insightful very nicely written, very fluid, uh, in, it flows very well. And it, it and, and two, three people told me, you know, and they were the people who worked with me in Airtel, and they said, you know, sir, it's like as though you're talking to us. Mm -hmm. You know, when we read the book, uh, we can picture you sitting in front of us and you're talking to us. And I said, oh my God, I didn't realize that perhaps my style of writing is the, is the style of speaking, I don't know. I know people say it should be different, uh, but if you're authentic, uh, should it be different? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question for another day. But personally, when I read the book, I understood what simplicity is all about. You define simplicity in the book very beautifully. It was very easy for anyone to understand where you're coming from, what you're saying, that we don't need to go check anywhere else and we are completely with you. Uh, Jagdish, a question here which while you were talking about how you were connecting to the employees, uh, it just uh, struck and I thought I can ask you this question. May is the month of mental health. 
and uh, with the layoffs every day being announced and the economic recession hitting everywhere, what is it that people need to do to keep themselves mentally strong? Because work outside, nobody knows. What is it that you can control? Do you have anything for people? Let me start with, I mean, you, know, you ended the question, what is it we can control? As a person, as a human being, we have only three things in our control. That's our perceptions, our decisions, and our actions. So in this mental turmoil, as, as I can call it, uh, let's say I've lost my job for various reasons. What is, it, what is my attention on? Is it blaming the organization who asked me to leave? Is it blaming myself that I'm not good enough? Or is it something else? And that something else is just, it happens to anybody and everybody. This time it's me. When I got the job, I didn't ask why me? So why am I asking why me when I've lost the job? Okay. So if it is if it's not me, do I believe in my own ability? Do I believe in my capabilities? Do I believe in myself? Do I believe I can overcome this? It's about how you're speaking to yourself. What are you telling yourself? You know, in my book also, I've talked about communication quotient impacting your IQ, your EQ, and your SQ. The way you speak to yourself impacts the way you think ab about, I mean, your abilities and the way you perform after that. If you think you're not good enough, you are not good enough. But if you think you can overcome this, and if you could think you can actually get another job, if you want another job, or you can do something else, which can is an opportunity. You know, there was a person I was coaching, very senior person. And because of some reshuffle in that organization, he was doing the same job, but the grade became one level lower because internationally they had changed a few things. And he didn't like it. And I was coaching him. So I tried to tell him that it's how you look at it. I said, Jagdish, I agree, but I don't like it. So I said, in that case, you have to take decisions. What is it you want to do? And he said, I'm going to quit. I said, okay. And then after that, what? So when he told me that he's going to quit, I told him that I have to now tell the HR manager that you're going to be quitting because otherwise it's a breach for me. So I have to tell him. He said, yeah, you can tell him. I've already told him. I said, oh, fine. Great. If you have already told him, then it takes that load off my chest. So I started talking to him about what is it you want to do? And he said, no, I'm, I'm going to be looking for an opportunities which are other than work, uh, other than employment. And he became a, a very successful entrepreneur now. It's now what, about four years or five years? And he took it as an opportunity. He had complete faith in himself, his own abilities. And he saw this as an opportunity. So my, my point to you is that if you see it as an opportunity, there's so much more to do. If you see it as a point to blame yourself or to blame others, you are pushing yourself into a, a cocoon where you will never get out. So stop blaming yourself or blaming others. Look for the opportunity, be in the moment and say, okay, what's my opportunity now? What can I do? There's A, B, C, D. Which is my strength? What is it I really want to do? And you'll find ways and means of doing it. Activate your RAS. There is opportunities for all of us. Every one of us can have a fulfilling life, provided that person wants it. Have I answered your question? I don't know. Yes, yes, you have. And if there are certain affirmations, somebody can tell themselves, because sometimes you lose faith in everyone around you and yourself, most of all. Are there certain techniques that you would think would help? Affirmation of telling yourself that you are good enough is, is required every day in the morning. Uh, if you are meditating, after you meditate or before you meditate, tell yourself. Uh, smile and tell yourself. Don't be serious and tell yourself, oh, I'm good enough, I'm good enough. No, 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 no. Smile and believe that you are really good enough. You know, I think belief is something which is, which is very important. My daughter has now graduated as a coach. I don't know what coaching... I mean, she does some life coaching and I don't know from which institute she has done it. But she, this is her mantra to her son, belief. You know, in, in his room also, there's a huge board which says belief, belief. And I'm coaching him a little bit in, in, in golf and he has a coach, a professional coach who teaches in golf. He's seven and a half. He believes he's a world champion in golf. He talks to me like a world champion. And today in the morning, he's won his fifth or the sixth tournament. This morning, this man tells me, Aju, it's so simple. You know, my handicap is 20. He says, your swing is good. You can play to three and four. I said, but son, I've been trying. It's not, it's not, say, no, no, no. You're not trying it hard enough. Let's play a game. I will play to one or two. You will play to five. Let's play a game. I mean, that's the way he talks at seven and a half. Now, when I look back, it's simply coming from the word belief. The way he communicates, the way he 
is is because he is being influenced by the way we communicate. He'll he'll when he talks to me, he'll say, "Aju, can I ask you a question?" Now, at his age, I never remember asking permission to ask a question for my dad or my granddad. You know, but this man, this boy is is so different because he is exposed to belief, and I think belief is something which is very critical, very very critical. And if you believe, uh, you can achieve what you want to achieve. Very true. And three life lessons, Jagdish, that you'd like to leave us with. I would say one is the belief. Uh, belief in your goals. Belief in yourself. Belief in your team. You know, when we are working in industry uh, with team members, uh, we always carry baggages. So, and the baggages is, is you know, oh, I need to give this to this person. I need to delegate. But last time this. He he didn't do a good job about that that other project. Do you still believe that he can do it or not believe it? Question is, can you start every conversation of yours with the belief that the other person is capable? You have to give that person opportunities to prove herself. You know, last time there was something which went wrong in the environment, maybe or somewhere else. Why are you holding that person responsible? Maybe the process is not good enough. If the process is not good enough, the person can't be held responsible. but we hold people responsible not processes you know and i think that's the mistake that we make i think if you start believing in people believing in your team in yourself and your goals uh, you can achieve anything that's been my mantra since i was 25 belief 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 the other uh, i think has come to me mainly in the pandemic and post pandemic is connect with people be grateful and invest in relationships the pandemic ke baad after the pandemic uh, me and my wife realized that we are living in bangalore our relations in bombay and other places we talk to them on the phone but we don't really meet and we all say that we are busy we are busy we are busy are we really that busy so we have now started in the last 3 years uh, we take 3 weeks off in a year no work at all we just go there plump and from morning to evening we are visiting people and we 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 call them up before and so what so and so date we'll come to you for breakfast for you with lunch for you for dinner we'll come to your home and we'll spend 2 3 hours with you so every every day in those 2 weeks or 3 weeks we go and meet people and we stay with my either my nephew or somebody else or my cousin or somebody and we we get to just spend time with people and i think investing in relationship is so important i don't think my father did ad- enough of it i am trying to make up and say no i will change that uh, you know because we all follow what our parents did you know my mother would go about meeting people uh, she would meet whole lot of relations all the time but my father always you know like him even i believed i was busy till i said no i got to change that and i think we need to really invest in relationships that second i would say is you know be grateful count your blessings is, is part of that the third i would say is uh, acknowledge uh, appreciate accept and allow things to happen in life you can't control it take it as learnings take it as lessons allow it to happen when you allow it to happen 50% of the solution is in that when you when you try to resist you are spending a lot of energy in resisting and you will never win that game what has to happen will happen like you talked about uh, somebody's lost his job or her job i mean these are things you can never control what you can control are those three things your perceptions your decisions your actions focus on that ask yourself every time i find this is a very powerful question for myself what is my attention on and i think it gives me great answers it slaps me at times but puts me on the track every time so i think allowing things to happen is is very very helpful to living life simple and successfully and i would say also disrupt yourself disrupt yourself before others disrupt you don't let others disrupt you you do it yourself jump that s curve which i've again talked in my book yeah uh, you know jump that curve to the next curve the next curve is happening it's rocking it's great go there don't be afraid keep take 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 your fears head on just face them when you see them in the eye the fear will go away but have that courage have that courage be vulnerable you know like like i think uh, bernie brown bernie brown says no i think it's the most accurate measurement of courage and authenticity 
Vulnerability. Vulnerability. Yes. You know, so be vulnerable. Vulnerability is a strength. And that's so true. So beautifully said, Jagdish. Thank you so very much. Honored to have had you on You and I with Rashmi Shetty. Your journey has been fantastic. But you know, putting them down in words is a bigger talent. And clearly, I'm waiting for your <laughs> next book to come out. <laughs> you have it all. And I'm sure there are many more stories that need to be heard and need to be read about. All the very best. Thank you for telling us about certain very simple things. But like one of my friends says, in a world where conversations don't exist anymore because we're so lost in the social media world, having conversations like this kind of gives me a lot of energy. So thank you for your time and stay blessed, continue inspiring. And thank you for just being the person you are. It thank was a you pleasure. So much. Thank you so much, Rashmi. Real pleasure. Look forward to meeting you in person soon. Likewise. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. With that, we complete this episode of You and I with Rashmi Shetty. Do let us know if you know inspirational people whose story needs to be heard. You can write in at rashmi.thirdeye at gmail.com. That is R-A-S-H-M-I dot T-H-E-T-H-I-R-D-E-Y-E -E at gmail.com.